So let's talk about all those announcements from both Sony and Apple because recently both Sony and Apple did have some big announcements to actually throw out and this gets me really excited of course as a tech fan and as a video game fan boy is there a lot to cover so yeah let's get right into the news first off i want to start with apple because apple released a whole bunch of brand new products recently the only unfortunate thing is the fact that Apple did not announce the brand new iPhone 12 line, unfortunately, due to some delays and due to what's going on currently around the world, they did have to delay that announcement. And apparently that announcement is actually coming sometime next month in October. So look forward to the iPhone 12's release in October but first off let's cover all these brand new products outside of the brand new products as well Apple did actually finally release brand new software for all their products we got brand new iOS 14 we also got iPad OS 14 watch uh, OS 7 I do believe and then even Apple TVs got updated uh, recently and you may be wondering which iPads and which iPhones are gonna get the brand new software. Well, if you're on iPhone, the oldest iPhone to actually uh, use this software, iOS 14, is going to be the iPhone 6S. Anything later than the 6S, unfortunately, will not be getting this brand new update, but that's still a very old phone, so props to Apple for actually allowing people who have the success to actually use this update and then for ipads if you have an ipad air 2 or newer you will be able to use this uh, update and all i can really say is again big shout outs to apple for them supporting these devices as long as they do it really does feel like anytime you actually buy a brand new uh, Apple product, you know you're going to be getting support for many, many years to come. They have some of the best support uh, in the industry. They may even have the best support in the industry because if you look at what uh, what uh, Android manufacturers are doing, even Google's own operated smartphones, they don't even give you the same amount of support as Apple does with all their Apple products. So it's nice to know that your device is going to be supported as long as it is so that's pretty nice on apple now when it comes to all these brand new uh software features i'm not really going to cover them in this video just because there's too many to talk about and that's not really the primary focus of this video it's more so on the lines of covering all these new announcements from apple when it comes to a uh, hardware first off let's actually talk about the brand new uh, Apple watches because Apple did unveil some brand new uh, watches first off we got the Apple watch series 6 and we have the Apple watch series se and the se is not a new Apple watch it is a technically a new one but it's not at the same time the reason being is the fact that the se is just really a rebranded older version of an iPhone of an uh, Apple watch it's kind of like what they do uh, with the uh, iPhone, with uh, the iPhone SE. It is technically a newer version of an iPhone, but it is still running uh, an older design. It's kind of like that. Now, what's new about the Apple Watch Series 6? Well, first of all, they are going to be giving you new color options and I think a new band as well. So that's actually a pretty nice. We are going to be getting more options when it comes to the Apple Watch. Anytime you get more options, it's just overall better. You can't really uh, argue with that. More options are always better. And it looks like the one key standout for options is gonna be that brand new red Apple Watch. And apparently from everywhere that I've seen on the internet, it looks like that red Apple Watch is gonna be a bright red instead of a dark red. So I know for a lot of people out there, this brand new Apple Watch in red is just not going to cut it because since you have to wear an apple watch all the time you guys know that a bright red wouldn't be really discreet it would really stick out a lot and some people just want to be under the radar want to be stealthy about their apple watch and the red ones 
uh, not for not gonna be for everyone, but it's nice again that we do get brand new color options for the uh, Apple Watch. Another thing they are doing with the Series Six is actually going to be oxygen blood levels. You can finally check your uh, oxygen levels with this brand new Apple Watch, and that's actually a uh, pretty great. I always love the fact that Apple, for a couple generations now, have been primarily focusing on health and health tracking. I just think it's really beneficial to our lives. In some scenarios, it could save your lives and things like that. Anything to improve our lives and anything that's really practical to our lives is always a step in the right direction in my eyes. So I'm actually pretty happy about this, that you will be able to finally check your blood oxygen levels with this brand new Apple Watch. And then outside of that, of course, another thing they do with every Apple Watch is, of course, give it much more fast faster chipsets and uh, more performance and more uh, and more uh, it's more efficient as a chipset so yeah you are getting new chipsets from Apple in the series 6 another nice thing is they did make the always on display much more brighter and you guys know with the Apple Watch most of the time or some of the time you'll be outside using the Apple Watch and sometimes you want to check your Apple Watch outside so anytime they can increase the brightness that's always going to be good now even though they increased the brightness of the always on display Apple did actually confirm that it's going to get the same amount of battery that the previous series got the series 5 and that's actually pretty nice because you would think this brighter always on display would actually wreck your battery but that's not actually the case here it looks like uh it's going to get the same battery so props to apple for giving you pretty much the same battery you had on your uh, previous apple watch and as far as i know that's pretty much all all there is that's brand new uh with the a apple watch uh series 6 of course you do get a brand new uh firmware as well i think watts os 7 i do believe and then moving over to the uh apple watch uh se the apple watch se is just pretty much a rebranded older uh apple watch and i would honestly say that if you're coming from a much more older uh, apple watch and you don't really care about the latest and greatest then maybe you should move over to the se or maybe if you never had an apple watch to begin with maybe now's the time to just pick up the uh, se so you can say that you actually just had one i think for both of these Apple Watches, one's going to come in at $399 and then one's going to come in at $299 uh, for the SE. So you can see, I think they're actually priced uh, pretty well for what you're actually getting when it comes to the uh, Apple Watch. And overall, yeah, some pretty nice uh, releases uh, for the Apple Watch. Now let's actually get into the meat and potatoes of the actual announcements because Apple recently announced two brand new iPads for 2020. Unfortunately, they did not announce a brand new iPad Pro. So unfortunately, the one from earlier this year is still gonna be their top of the line tablet for uh, 2020 uh, so far. But let's talk about these two brand new iPads that Apple just announced. First of all, let's talk about the very cheap iPad, the budget iPad, the iPad 8th generation and the iPad 8th generation is pretty much like the previous iPad 7th generation that was released uh, last September in uh, 2019. They didn't do anything to the design here. You're still rocking that same 10.2 inch screen. You're still rocking the same uh, the same design as it. You're still rocking the same screen. Pretty much everything is the same when it comes to this thing. The only thing they actually changed with the iPad 8th generation base model budget iPad is going to be the chipset. You're going from an A10 chipset to the brand new A12 chipset. So you can see that one is a much more better performing uh, chipset uh, to this thing. And they kept the price the same. It's going to start at $329. And honestly, I'm not really too happy with the storage options that they are going to be giving you uh, with this iPad. If you look uh, at the sto the base storage for this uh, iPad, it's only going to be 32 gig. I know in 
I know in Apple's defense, they're probably like, yeah, most people who are buying the budget iPad aren't gonna really do anything outside of light web browsing and maybe watching videos and things like that. So what's the point of giving us uh, more storage? And I know they always try to give users a reason to upgrade to the next model with more storage because this uh, base iPad will come in two different storage options. You got that 32 gig option for 329 and then you got that 128 gig version for 429 and I'm not really a fan of paying more money for more storage, especially when more storage is uh, always expensive, at least from Apple when we know clearly storage doesn't cost that much to actually produce. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a waste of money or you're kind of like, <clears throat> paying too much just for uh, extra storage, which is a little bit uh, ridiculous. If you ask me, and 32 gig for the base model is unacceptable, especially uh, in 2020, not just if you're gonna store stuff, but of course a lot of people download applications and you may wanna do other things on your tablet. And since you may wanna do other things on your tablet, it's really kind of unfortunate. They at least didn't start with 64, 64 gig. I just think 32 gig is unacceptable. And two things you have to realize as well with these tablets or with anything that does have storage capacity. One is when you get this out of the box, you're immediately not gonna have 32 gig. You can knock that down like three or four gig just because the operating system's installed. And I think there's something else with memory that automatically knocks it down. So you crack it, crack it out of the box and you're probably talking like 20, 29, 28, 27 gig. And that's honestly pretty tiny if you ask me a couple of games here a couple of documents a couple of videos whatever you want to store and we're talking about not a lot of space uh for this thing and i'm not too uh happy about that but it is what it is uh for this and on top on top of that as well you do have to realize each and every year apple actually has updates for all their devices and updates also take a lot of memory sometimes two three four gig and since these updates just eat through your memory it's kind of like yeah then that base storage of 32 gig really does seem puny and tiny uh at the end of the day now who should actually buy this ipad if you're asking me honestly, I think this iPad is pretty much for every single person out there. And I think most people can get by with the uh, the budget iPad or the iPad 8th generation, honestly, because all iPads run the same software and they do practically the same thing minus the performance being a little bit worse in each individual iPad. But for the most part, I think this iPad is practically for everyone. It's a really great deal at 329. If you don't have an iPad or you're thinking about getting an iPad, I really do think that you should pull the trigger at 329. It's not like you're gonna feel like you're getting robbed with the price. I really do think the price point is perfect for this iPad for what you're paying for. You're getting some of the best performance on a tablet. You're also getting a really reliable tablet. You're also getting an Apple supported tablet. So you know when you buy an Apple supported tablet, you'll get support for many, many years to come. And if you were to compare the 329 iPad, the uh, cheap iPad to other tablets in the same uh, area, honestly, I don't even think there's anything else that really compares to the iPad at that price point. And I really do think that the iPad is a no-brainer at 329. I will have to make it clear though, if you do not need an iPad right away, I would personally wait it out until the holiday season just because with last year's base model or the cheap iPad. They did always have it on sale throughout the year and it was pretty much always on sale and you usually found it lower than 329. Like for instance, most of the time I saw the base iPad going for 250, whether it's around the holiday season or whether it's just discounts throughout the year. Most of the time, believe it or not, it stayed at 250. So that's why I'm saying wait it out if you can wait it out because you will get a deep discount on this iPad. But again, if your iPad's getting older or you just need an iPad for whatever the case may be, I would say pull the trigger now on this iPad. You won't be disappointed. It's one heck of a deal. You can get the iPad, you can get the Apple Pencil. You can also get the Smartfolio keyboard with this thing because 
It does have some accessories and overall it's a really great deal. And it looks like also it does come in the same color, uh, same color uh, options as last year. They really didn't add anything here. You got space gray, silver, and uh, a gold option here for uh, this iPad. And now let's actually move up to the iPad Air because Apple did finally release a brand new iPad Air. And this iPad Air is a dramatic update compared to last year's iPad Air uh, 3 or the 2019 edition of the iPad Air. This thing really did get a pretty big significant update and a pretty big overhaul as well. The big key thing with this iPad Air 4 is the fact that it's pretty much now a watered down iPad Pro when you look at this thing and that's absolutely fantastic of course now that it's pretty much a watered down ipad pro that does mean that this ipad air 4 is going to be more expensive than last year's ipad air 3 2019 version we're talking 600 dollars instead of 500 dollars, which is obviously a little unfortunate because it is going to cost you more money but you are getting a much more better performing tablet and a better looking device. The biggest thing with the iPad Air 4 is the fact that it does share the same design as the uh, iPad uh, Pro 2018 version. And that's absolutely fantastic because no longer do you have big, big thick bezels around the actual screen. It's going to look more modern. Overall, it's just going to feel amazing in the hand. We're also talking about improvements in almost every way with this iPad. And they did bump up the screen size of this iPad from last year's iPad Air. The last year's iPad Air came in at 10.5 inches and this one's gonna be bumped up to 10.9 inches, which is actually uh, fantastic. And you're pretty much gonna get all the features that the iPad Pro has minus a few. And let's talk about those. One is you are getting that brand new design from the iPad Air 2018, which is still their modern day design. They still use it in their iPad Pros today. And on top of that, you are going to be getting for the first time in the air USB type C and I really do think USB type C is amazing just because everything uses USB type C alongside that I really do think if you're going to be transferring data all the time USB type C is going to be a much more faster connect connection so that's great as well another thing they are taking from the iPad Pro is going to be the, the stereo speakers, no longer will you have two speakers at the bottom. You will get speakers on both sides of the tablet. So in the long run, you should get better sound as well. One thing they did actually add to this brand new iPad Air fourth generation is something that we've never seen in any other Apple product to date. They're finally bringing back Touch ID, but they're bringing it back in a very different way. Basically, what's going on is they're going to put the uh, brand new Touch ID in the actual power button instead of the home button, since obviously this one doesn't really have any space for a home button. So they had to put it somewhere. And I'm actually okay with this uh, implementation. I know when it comes to things like uh, fingerprint sensors, you can put fingerprint sensors in number of different areas on devices. Like for instance, you can put them on the back of the device, you can put them in the screen, or you can put them on the home button. We've seen all these implementations before. And I think the power button is actually a really nice place to put it because you're gonna be turning this on and off anyway, or turning on the screen. So it's nice to just be able to put one of your fingers on the uh, power button and it automatically unlocks your device without anything like a, a past traditional password so that's actually pretty convenient and i know apple being apple they really didn't want to take a chance on an under the display fingerprint sensor just because i i know for a factor a lot of times those just aren't reliable and in today's uh technology market there's really no uh good fingerprint sensor that covers the whole entire screen. So that means you would have to place your finger in a certain area on the screen every time, which I guess the Apple's just not that great. One thing they did with this, since they did decide to put a uh, fingerprint sensor or touch ID on the power button, they didn't give this iPad 
any uh, face ID. And honestly, I'm a little bummed about that because I would, I would have liked it if they would have put both on this tablet. You give us touch ID and you give us face ID because more options are always better, of course. And I would have liked it a lot, but that's kind of too unfortunate. I guess the good news is now that we have Touch ID on the brand new iPad Air 4, other Apple devices in the near future should be getting Touch ID just like this. I would assume maybe the uh, iPhone 12 line, maybe the next iPad Pro and things like that. So I'm actually really glad about this. And there is something also very uh, interesting about this brand new uh, Air. The interesting thing about this Air is the fact that for the first time, it's going to be using the brand new A14 Bionics chip from Apple. And I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're probably thinking, how, did this have, how does this tablet have the A14 chip from Apple? And it is the mid-tier iPad, whereas the current generation iPad Pros have the A12Z Bionics chip. How can that be? Well, from what I'm hearing around the internet, actually, a lot of people are still saying that the, that the more expensive iPad Pros still have slightly more performance. Granted, you can't really take their word for it just because this tablet launches next month in October. And since this tablet launches next month in October, it's really hard to say if the performance of this is going to be slightly worse than the iPad Pros or slightly better than the iPad Pros. Honestly, I would assume it would get worse performance than the iPad Pros because the iPad Pros are much more expensive devices. I think we're talking about $200 more for the base iPad Pro 11 inch. And if that's the case, why would you spend m more money to get less? It just doesn't make sense, but we'll have to wait and see until this tablet actually finally comes out to the market to see if that's the, that's the case or not. Now, who is this iPad for? Well, I think it's for a lot of different people. I still think the budget iPad though is still the iPad for honestly everyone because again they run the same exact operating system iPad OS so it's not like you're losing features there these iPad Pros and these iPad Airs are just kind of like icing on the cake when it comes to the actual features you do get some nice uh, hardware improvements to these tablets but it's not that much better than something like the base iPad but honestly if you ask me I don't think anyone at the current moment should buy the current iPad Pros in any form, whether it's the 11 inch or whether it's the 12.9 inch. Honestly, I would say just wait it out because at the time of this recording and at looking at all this stuff, I really do think, again, like I said before, these are just watered down iPad Pros with the iPad Air 4. And for what you're getting, you are losing some features which I didn't even talk about. Like for instance, the biggest thing you're gonna be missing out on is ProMotion, where you don't have a 120 hertz display. We're only talking 60 hertz display. But I think for most people and a lot of people, it's not enough for you to justify that much more expensive iPad Pro compared to this because it's pretty much the same thing. You're getting the same design. You're getting USB type C. You're also going to be getting a you're also going to be getting that quad, that stereo speaker sound. You're also going to be getting the same type of uh the same type of accessories. Like for instance, you are going to be getting the second generation iPad pencil. You're also even going to be able to use the brand new magic keyboard that they released with the brand new iPad pros this year. So you can see this really does seem like a value over the iPad pros. And what's the reason to even buy an iPad pro here? It kind of feels like you're wasting that extra month, extra money. And honestly, I still don't understand why Apple made this thing so appealing compared to the iPad pros. Why do the iPad pros nowadays even exist? Sure. You still get things like a bigger display on them. You still get pro motion. You may get slightly better performance apparently, but it just doesn't seem like the uh, cons of those tablets outweigh what the iPad Air actually uh, has to offer. It really does seem like the iPad Pros are miles better than the iPad Air. Sure, in 2019, that was a different story. And if they still sold that old iPad Air, I would say, yeah, there's enough reasons to buy that, that uh, more expensive iPad Pro. But now it's like, 
No, there's really no reason to buy that. And I would recommend almost everybody who, who was considering a Pro for whatever reason, go ahead and buy the iPad Air 4. And there is one nice thing about the Air that no other tablet has. It's going to have the most color options of any iPad on the market. Uh, actually, currently, if you look at the lineup and I go ahead and try to buy one right now, it's going to show me all the color options. And you have Space Gray silver rose gold green which is a new color for ipads and then sky blue is also a new color for ipads we've never seen these ipads in these colors before so you can see you have five different color options for this brand new ipad and that's actually pretty amazing and that's something i never really understood about apple why do Always, they're much more cheaper hardware, always get more color options, but they're much more expensive hardware, never gets color options. And that's something I'm not a fan of personally because a lot of times I am a tech enthusiast and I usually buy the latest and greatest from a company. And a lot of times it kind of sucks that they feel like the cheaper people deserve the more color options, but the people who are spending more money don't deserve those color options. They always want to make the much more premium expensive versions of their products, whether it's for instance, like the iPhone or the iPad, they want to make sure it looks premium and doesn't really look kitty or doesn't really look as non fancy as the other ones, which is kind of a thing that I kind of disagree with because having color options is always better. You should let the user decide if they want their expensive device to look premium or if they want it to look a little bit more, I would say, kitty. if you get what I'm saying with these devices. It just honestly blows my mind, but it is what it is. But overall, yeah, this is probably one of the most exciting releases from Apple, the iPad Air 4th generation uh, and yeah, it's looking like a good tablet. Again, it's going to be $599 for the base model. And this base model is going to come with 64 gig storage. So at least we're getting a bump up from that 32 gig uh, cheap iPad. And then if you want a much more uh, storage for this iPad, it's going to be $749 for 256 gigs. So you can see the, the end model is 256. If you need more storage, you are going to have to go to the iPad Pro because I know the iPad Pros have a 512 option and I do think a one terabyte option uh, for those tablets. So be a lookout on that. And again, this tablet will release in October if you're thinking about picking up the brand new iPad Air uh, fourth generation. Now let's actually move on to some Sony news because there is a lot to talk about when it comes to Sony because recently Sony did talk about more PS5 news and we did get a couple of new announcements when it comes to games and things like that. The funny thing is, even though they did do some brand new announcements for the PS5, unfortunately, we still don't know what the official game release is going to be or the launch lineup for the PS5. And honestly, I'm kind of still in shock. They wouldn't have even told us the uh, launch lineup for the PS5 because now we, we, we're still scrambling around wondering about the uh, PS5 launch and uh, things like that. And to make things worse about it, Sony lied to us about the PS5 launch because pre-orders are already sold out, which is honestly ridiculous. Everyone on the internet is up in arms about this and I agree it's not fair to everyone that all these retailers recently already started having pre-orders and everywhere you look the pre-orders for the PS5 are out and honestly I was going to pre-order a PS5 but I can now not pre-order a PS5 since they decided to uh just released a PS5 randomly and pre-orders went up everywhere and that's really unfortunate they practically uh lied to us some people have a theory though that the reason Sony lied to us or why retailers just randomly drop pre-orders uh, is the fact that uh, they didn't want scalpers to actually be ready uh, for the uh, pre-orders if Sony announced them on a certain day. I think they were actually supposed to go live from what I'm hearing on September 17th. But of course, that obviously didn't happen. Uh, that's why so many people are mad about this situation. Will you be able to get one on launch deal? It's going to be hard to say, but I do know 
Sony has been claiming with everything that's going on in the world that a stock is going to be limited on the PS5. So most likely, if you try to walk into a store on the day this is released, I know it's coming out in America on November 12th, most likely you're probably not going to be getting one unless you're very fortunate and you just see one on a store shelf. But I probably doubt that and you're probably going to be waiting weeks on end uh for this thing to come in stock you can even be waiting an extra month for all i know for this thing but the situation just doesn't look good uh for the uh, ps5 it looks pretty bad but going back to all the announcements they did announce some pretty nice things when it comes to the game side and what games are coming out for the ps5 they announced some good games but we still don't know the launch lineup like i said and looking at that recent uh, announcement video for all those games, it really did feel like a lot of the, that information was really just information we already previously knew about some of those upcoming games. We did get some brand new games that we didn't know were coming. Like for instance, one of the biggest games that they announced for the uh, PS5 definitely had to be Final Fantasy 16, I do believe. And uh, that game absolutely looks uh, fantastic. You can see they're really taking Final Fantasy into a different direction. A lot of people are saying that this Final Fantasy may not be a traditional party-based Final Fantasy. It's going to play more like uh, a Dark Souls game or just a single party game. But I'm okay with that. The Final Fantasy 16, from what I'm seeing uh, from the actual trailers looks like a, a fantastic game and it's looked like something I would personally play and then another game that still looks fantastic is that that Spider-Man Mar that Spider-Man game I don't want to butcher his name because I can't remember it off the top of my head but that brand new Spider-Man game for PS5 looks uh, fantastic and then of course a surprise that I didn't know was coming which I think most people didn't know was coming was that brand new uh, Harry Potter open world game. That game absolutely looks fantastic and that's something I would personally buy if that was a release title or if it came out a couple months after, I would personally pull the trigger because I do like Harry Potter and I do want a brand new take on open world games or just games in general and that one looks like a fantastic game and that's something I'm personally excited for. And then some other stuff, I don't think they announced uh, too too much else that really got me excited and that I can personally, re personally remember from those announcements. The nice thing that, that Sony finally did was they finally gave us information on the prices of this because for the longest time we didn't know what the prices were for the uh, ps5 consoles but of course sony probably wanted to wait until microsoft released their uh, console prices because they wanted to uh, either match the competition or uh, beat the competition in the price and that makes sense and it looks like what Sony is going to be doing is they're pretty much going to be doing what Microsoft is doing. If you look at their uh, high-end console, the regular PS5, it's going to come in at $500. And then the Xbox Series X, which is the high-end model of the next Xbox, that's also going to come in at uh, $500. And I think for most consumers out there, when you look at $500, it is still expensive, but I think it's not reaching the line to where you feel like you're kind of getting ripped off or it's a little bit too much just to play a video game. And I think most people aren't going to be upset and it's going to sell out everywhere for $500. If it was six or $700, people would be like, yeah, that's a little bit too much to actual game in, in, in reality. It's not really a lot of money, especially if you look at the PC side of gaming, but that's not how consumers look at video game consoles as a whole. We're talking about a whole different crowd compared to PC uh, enthusiasts. So yeah, anything past 500, people will give them looks. And then uh, for the for the cheaper model, the PS5 discless version, it looks like that's going to come in at $399. A lot of people were wondering, is that going to be $50 off or is that going to be $100 off? And I think if Sony marketed it, marketed it at $50 off, I honestly think that wouldn't be enough for most people because most people are like, $50? Why would I spend, why would I save $50 when I'm getting no disk drive? I might as well go... Uh, to the regular PS5 because I'll be able to play uh, physical games and uh, 
digital games as well. And that $50 price point is not going to be enough to persuade me. At least in my opinion, it wouldn't persuade me. I would honestly just buy the uh, much more expensive uh, PS5. Now that you're actually saving $100, I think for me personally, $100 is enough to persuade me to, to uh, get the digital version because $100 is still $100 that I don't have to spend uh, for this system. But for me, of course, I am an enthusiast. I play games all the time. If I was to own the system for the life, life, life cycle of the system, I would buy the, the regular uh, PS5. Granted, it doesn't really matter because we all know with these uh, consoles that come out, all of these consoles usually get like a uh, mid-life recycle, whether it's like last generation with a brand new better performing console or whether it's like most uh, consoles out there where they get a slight refresh, but it's just a uh, much more smaller and uh, quieter system. So most likely you don't have to worry about whichever PlayStation 5 you buy because uh, they're most likely going to make another one down the line a little bit more quieter, a little bit more uh, smaller with additional features and uh, things like that. And honestly, I think these are very good price points for both of these consoles. And I don't think uh, anyone is really going to complain. From what I'm actually hearing on the internet, I'm actually hearing both Sony and Microsoft are actually taking a loss on these systems because if you were to buy these or if you were to make these uh, game consoles with the equivalent specs on a normal gaming PC it would actually be quite more expensive and yeah they had to not go over $500 though because again most consumers would see this as not being a practical for gaming at least for console gamers but then again Microsoft and Sony are not actually making much money back on each individual console, they're actually taking a loss. And I know that sounds crazy to some of you who don't know how tech works, but they're gonna make their money back on, on accessories and hardware. Like for instance, apparently there's a new article that just came out that keeps stating that prices of video games are going up and there are some brand new video games that are gonna cost $70, unfortunately. I know a lot of you guys don't want to hear that, especially if you are in Canada because Canadian prices are absolutely crazy uh, for video games. Right now, I think normal video games cost about $80, I want to say. And for Canadians, that's a lot of money just to play a video game. And if prices go up, of course, they're going to be close to almost $100 US dollars uh, with their video game spending. And that's absolutely crazy. I'm not too happy about this, but I understand that development costs go up. You have to pay your workers. You have to make more money. If it costs more to make these amazing games, then I guess I'm okay with 10 more dollars. I'm only okay with it as long as they do not throw in all these unnecessary microtransactions. I'm okay with microtransactions that don't ruin the user experience like cosmetic items for your character and things like that. But once you kind of force us with bad microtransactions that kind of make us feel like we have to pay for these microtransactions, especially in a multiplayer game, that's where I draw the line here. And that's where I'm not actually too happy uh, with this situation. And honestly, that's when I just throw up my hands and like, yeah, you shouldn't be charging 70 more dollars because although you're charging 70 more dollars, you're throwing in all these bad micro transactions and that's something I am personally not a fan of but as long as they can keep that down to a minimum and don't really haggle us with those kind of things then I'm okay with paying $70 because let's face it if you were to play these games for as long as you play them you probably already got your money back to to begin with especially if you buy something like a big open world game for 70 you're gonna get a lot of money for your a lot of value for your money or if you bought a multiplayer game, of course, you're going to get a lot of uh, value for that $70. But it is what it is. And it will ultimately suck that we're going to have to start paying $70. But apparently $70 is not going to be the uh, in industry standard when it comes to video games. Some developers are going to do it. And some developers are not going to do it. It looks like Demon Souls... And the ultimate edition of Miles Morales are both going to be $70, just like NBA 2K and the upgraded Call of Duty uh, 
Cold War for next generation games are going to be a little bit more as well, which is unfortunate. But if it has to be done, it has to be done. And honestly, the only way to uh, get these prices to go back to normal is if you speak with your wallet. But let's be honest, a lot of gamers aren't going to speak with their wallet. They're just going to end up paying the $70 and go down the road. And I think it is what it is. But yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. And then another thing regarding video games, it looks like PlayStation Plus members who do subscribe to PlayStation Plus, it looks like for next generation gaming, they will be able to play some backwards compatible games. Now, the, the, the weird thing about this is Sony did not directly announce how this is going to work. Are you going to have to have a PlayStation uh, Plus uh, account to play these backwards compatible games and still pay for them? like you would normally do, or will you just have a PlayStation Plus account that lets you play online and you get these games at no additional cost? A lot of people are actually saying how it's gonna work is, you subscribe to PlayStation Plus like you normally do, and then on the PS5, you'll just log into the PSN store and you'll be able to download a whole bunch of backwards compatible games to the actual PS5. And honestly, I think that would be a win-win scenario for Sony, especially since I again I told you these consoles are 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 actually uh, make not making these companies money, and since they're not making these companies money, they really need to find a way to try to sell as many accessories and video games as possible. And the only way to do that is give give a very good reason for them to buy games. And this generation i really do feel like is a generation of subscription based services so you need to try to get your consumers and your gamers to try to get something like xbox games pass or psn or something like that to really try to uh incite them to keep paying that reoccurring payment and i think this would be a great way to get more people to pay for playstation plus which they wouldn't normally pay for playstation plus but now that you're getting a whole bunch of backwards compatible ps4 games that are great games as well that is an incentive for a lot of people especially on day one if you signed up for it and you just got all these backwards compatible games right away just keep in mind this is not confirmed and i'm not sure about this but from what i'm hearing that is going to be the case for this on top of that let's move over to some accessories because it looks like right now we might know the price of the ps5 dual sense controller and it looks like the ps5 dual sense controller is going to be relatively expensive but that should be no shock to you just because this controller is kind of like the pro controller from nintendo it's going to have a lot of features it's going to have those haptic feedback triggers it's going to have a gyro in it it's going to have a speaker in it it's going to just have overall better uh, features and it looks like this controller is going to go up i think current controllers cost around 60 and this one's going to cost uh 70 dollars and i'm okay with the price increase because we will get more features and let's face it most of the time your controller rarely breaks so even if these controllers are expensive you only need to buy like one or two controllers and most of the time you are good to go for the for the life of the actual system so that's a great news it sucks that it is 70 dollars because you look at the price of the games you look at the price of the hardware you look at the price of the controller and it really does seem like the games are going up you have to pay for these subscription services now kind of you have to pay for the accessories and, and in microsoft's case you have to pay for things like extra storage and that's supposed to be very expensive very expensive for extra storage for uh, the uh, Xbox. You look at everything and everything's just going up and it really does seem like video games as a whole are just a very expensive thing uh, to get into. But I guess gamers are used to paying for video games and used to paying for subscription services and used to paying for all this stuff that we're just used to it by now. They pretty much just nickel and dime us, but it is what it is. And yeah, I think that's pretty much going to be it for uh, today's episode and I think that's all I actually wanted to cover anyway guys this is Wayne from my tech news signing out